It's my great pleasure to present some of the excerpts uh, regarding post-operative atrial fibrillation and surgical therapy for atrial fibrillation uh, from the 2016 focused update of the CCS guidelines on the management of AF. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this was a team effort between Dr. Alan Skeynes and myself uh, and uh, I'm very happy to present this uh, on behalf of both of us. So let's start with some of the clinical considerations that we think about regarding surgical AF ablation procedures. Of course, we uh, think about the overall potential benefits of achieving sinus rhythm, uh, the type of surgery, mitral valve versus other types of open heart surgery, the extent of the procedure, i.e. a left-sided maze versus a biatrial maze, the energy source, associated risk, and local expertise. There has been one randomized trial led by Dr. Mark Gilinov uh, from the CTSnet uh, group of investigators that has been published recently evaluating surgical ablation of atrial fibrillation during mitral valve surgery. And in this study, 260 patients with persistent atrial fibrillation who required mitral valve surgery were randomized to either surgical ablation or no ablation during mitral valve operation. Uh, patients were uh, further randomized to pulmonary vein isolation or biatrial maze. All patients underwent closure of the left atrial appendage and the primary endpoint of the trial was freedom uh, from atrial fibrillation both at 6 and 12 months assessed by a 3D Holter. Uh, here are the main results uh, looking at freedom from atrial fibrillation. In panel A uh, you can uh, see quite nicely that uh, mitral valve surgery coupled with ablation had a significantly higher rate of freedom from atrial fibrillation. And on panel B are the data that suggests that there was no difference uh, with respect to the type of ablation, i.e. biatrial maze versus pulmonary vein isolation achieved a very similar outcome. Um, what I have not uh, shown you, uh, but are uh, data available within the, uh, uh, the, the full slide deck, are the fact that uh, overall mortality, morbidity uh, were not different uh, in terms of major efficacy endpoints. Uh, the trial was not powered for that, uh, but from a safety point of view, there was a threefold higher rate of uh, the use of uh, permanent pacemakers. And I think this is something that the committee thought about uh, quite long and hard about balancing uh, risk and benefits of sinus rhythm versus uh, the uh, risk of uh, a permanent pacemaker. So we suggest that surgical AF ablation procedures should be considered in association with mitral valve, aortic valve, or cabbage surgery in patients with atrial fibrillation when the likelihood of success is deemed to be high, the additional risk is low, and sinus rhythm is expected to achieve substantial symptomatic benefit. This is a conditional recommendation with moderate quality evidence. Now, let's uh, also look at some of the uh, data around surgical left atrial occlusion, exclusion, if I may, for stroke prevention. Uh, most of this field has been driven by cohort studies. Uh, there's a paucity of randomized trials, but one very important and Canadian-led trial is ongoing called the LAOS-3 study. The LAOS-3 study, which is being led by uh, Dr. Richard Whitlock and Dr. Stuart Connolly, and we are participating in this study. Uh, 4,700 patients in approximately 80 centers are being randomly allocated to occlusion of the left atrial appendage versus no occlusion on top of usual standard of care. And uh, the primary outcome is a sort of standard uh, MACE outcome. Uh, and uh, this trial is now about half, report, half recruited. So we are looking forward to the, 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 the full recruitment and eventual reporting of this, uh, these results. So the fact that there is no randomized control trial data thus far has led the committee to downgrade the recommendation and we've said that in patients with atrial fibrillation we suggest that closure uh, either through excision or obliteration of the left atrial appendage should be considered as part of the surgical ablation procedure of atrial fibrillation associated with mitral, aortic or cabbage surgery if this does not increase the risk of surgery. This is a conditional recommendation and again based on low quality of evidence. 
What about management of post-operative atrial fibrillation? Uh, again, some uh, important reminders that this occurs in a large proportion of patients. The condition is associated with high sympathetic and oxidative stress and inflammation. And it's also associated with increased rates of major cardiovascular outcomes, length of stay, and costs. So new guidelines addressing treatment of post-operative atrial fibrillation and the prophylaxis of post-operative atrial fibrillation have been undertaken. And really, uh, uh, Dr. Alan Skeynes is to be credited for uh, really leading this section. Uh, we have made the following recommendation that post-operative atrial fibrillation might be appropriately treated with either a ventricular response rate control strategy or a rhythm control strategy. This is a based on strong, rec this is a strong recommendation based on moderate quality evidence. This recommendation places a high value on the randomized control trial data that have investigated rate control as an alternative to rhythm control for atrial fibrillation, including one trial that specifically addressed the cardiac post-operative period. The choice of strategy should therefore be individualized based on the basis of the degree of symptoms experienced by the patient. This time we've actually also included some data uh, reviewing uh, the studies limiting inflammation and oxidative stress and uh, they are trials with statins, steroids and polyunsaturated fa fatty acids. Uh, there is a randomized control trial of 1,922 patients uh, who uh, received perioperative resuvastatin or placebo. It showed no reduction in the rates of post-operative atrial fibrillation. Uh, but had a statistically significant increase in the rate of acute kidney injury. Uh, steroids, a systematic review on the use of steroids suggested a beneficial effect on the basis of 14 studies when tested in two definitive studies that randomized over 11,000 patients. However, no benefit was seen and a potential small signal of harm was noted. And polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, two meta-analyses, 2,600 patients plus uh, one was negative, the other one was positive, and as a consequence of different trial weighting, it was hard for us to evaluate this area precisely. The largest randomized trial randomized uh, 1,500 patients with uh, no difference in sustained symptomatic or treated episodes of post-operative atrial fibrillation. So uh, as uh, sort of key take-homes uh, in this area, we suggest that patients who have a contraindication to beta blocker therapy uh, and to amiodarone before or after surgery be considered for prophylactic therapy to prevent post-operative atrial fibrillation with either intravenous magnesium, this is a conditional recommendation based on low quality evidence, or colchicine, which is also a conditional recommendation based on low quality evidence or biatrial pacing, which is also a conditional recommendation based on low quality evidence. Uh, the data on colgesin, I again haven't had time to review with you in this very short excerpt, uh, but uh, the small meta-analyses suggest that it may be beneficial, but it has to be, rem we have to remember that there's a significant issue around tolerability and discontinuation due to gastrointestinal uh, uh, intolerance with colchicine. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, with respect to anticoagulation for post-operative atrial fibrillation, we suggest that consideration be given uh, to anticoagulation therapy if post-operative continuous AF persists for more than 72 hours. This consideration will include individualized assessment of the risks of thromboembolic events and the risk of post-operative bleeding. Uh, it's been great uh, having a few minutes uh, to spend with you today. Uh, I hope uh, you will enjoy uh, the overall guidelines and that they will be valuable in making appropriate clinical decisions in patients who are going to surgery or in individuals in whom you're trying to prevent post-operative atrial fibrillation. Thank you.